Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Northeastern University Civil Engineering Alumni Organization. We're an organization that provides support to Northeastern Civil Engineering Department, its students, and its alumni. Today, we'll discuss how engineering and construction firms are adapting to this new normal. We will touch on the challenges firms have faced and the dramatic shifts in company culture. I'm Ali Goldberg. I'm the project engineer at Weston and Sampson, a Northeastern alum and today's moderator. COVID-19 has affected all of our lives in very drastic ways. Like many of you, I've experienced challenges both personally and professionally. A challenge for me was starting a new job in March 2020. My computer and all my work supplies were shipped directly to my home and I was onboarded remotely. I've truly valued getting to know all my new coworkers via virtual happy hours. Today, we will learn hear from industry leaders who will share their own experiences. They'll talk about how they, how they have managed to ensure the safety of their clients, colleagues, and themselves while maintaining and completing projects. We'll also touch on maintaining the company values in a virtual setting. Our 30 minute panel discussion will be followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. We encourage you all to write your questions in the chat, which we will be monitoring throughout the event. After the Q&A, please join us for optional networking in Zoom breakout rooms. Panelists this afternoon include Aaron Gallagher, Joanna Hall, and Steve Duvel. Aaron is Vice President and Director of Civil Engineering at Niche Engineering. He has 22 years of experience in the civil engineering field where he's provided design and consulting services to a wide range of projects. Joanna Hall is a team leader at Weston and Sampson. With 16 years of experience, she's been an integral part of Weston and Sampson since she graduated Northeastern in 2005. Steve is a senior vice president of the New England division of Gilbane Building Company. He has 26 years of experience and is responsible for operation, sales, and administrative functions. Thank you all for being here with us today. Let's get started. Hey, Steve, how you doing? I'm awesome this morning. Thank you so much for having me, Allison. Great. The first question's for you. Sure. What specific actions or initiatives have you enacted to stay connected with staff? Yeah, so, you know, building is a team sport, right? Um, whether you're in the engineering side or the construction side and, um, and you know, forced to be separate uh, from each other. Uh, Allison, terrible story about uh, your experience of onboarding, you know, starting, starting your first day of work at home must have been uh, surreal. Um, oh, yeah. But even as human beings, you know, we are social, social creatures. So, um, some actions that I've taken specifically, um, uh, specifically when COVID hit in the spring, was making like deliberate phone calls uh, to my staff, the people that reported directly to me, um, without an agenda of work, like not like, did you finish this? Did you do that? When is this going to get done? But more like, you know, how are you doing? You know, how, how are you feeling? You know, how is your place, you know, how is your, is your workstation set up? And, and what is it like on the, on the projects now? That, that element of the human touch. And not only the folks that reported to me, but also my boss, you know, like I called my boss because we could, you know, that those interactions were reduced dramatically. Um, so just, just having those deliberate check-ins, it wasn't accidental, like once a week, I made the calls whether I needed to or not to check in. Another example of uh, things that we've done is um, like we in the fall went through our strategic planning session. Um, and rather than just getting into the nuts and the bolts of like, okay, you know, we need safety is number one. What are we gonna do for safety? We actually started the meeting with a conversation like what's the best thing that you did in 2020, like an accomplishment that you're so proud of. And, and you know, I shared a story like my son and I went out on a day in August at Block Island. And in two hours, we caught like 20 fish. Like it was the most amazing experience, a time that I'll never forget. And uh, those shared experiences, um, because in this Zoom world that we're in, and even on our construction sites, uh, sites are 
teams are spread out, right? We're not meeting at the water cooler and whispering about what a jerk our bosses are anymore, you know, but giving a, giving a time where we can um, just talk about ourselves and our lives uh, and it adds enrichment to our lives. So I would say another tactic deliberate alley that we've done is to tie in um, those non-work elements into, into our serious planning sessions. Um, another thing I've done for connectivity is uh, just because of my uh, position at, at Gilbane, you know, we do about a billion dollars worth of work annually in New England, and uh, there's 400 employees is, um, you know, I send out, I've sent out a, an email each month trying to provide connectivity, connectivity, like this is what's happening in our world, uh, just to open people up from the macro that they've been working on until like, we are part of a bigger picture, right? And we're building with purpose, like we're servicing our clients and that, that empathy, like this sucks and, and we're all in it together. Um, and then lastly, it's been, uh, and everyone has seen it, right? It's been super convenient to say like, oh, we're not gonna do that this year, you know, COVID, you know, can't get together, so sorry. Uh, this year, um, so for example, we have a, a regional dinner that we've held every year. Uh, in the last three years, we held it at Patriots Place. You know, and it's cool. You can go and you look over the football field and imagine where Tom Brady used to be. And uh, like, it was a great event to bring everybody together. And this year it would have been super easy to say, oh, COVID can't get together. But, but we leverage technology. Um, we use a program called Remos that brought everybody together. It's kind of like Zoom on steroids. But we did it anyhow, and, and we brought, you know, all of our employees together and 200 people attended and made it very interactive. And we still got to connect and share all of our accomplishments and celebrate the successes of individuals and teams and just provided an outlet for folks to, to share and be together. So um, I would say there weren't any initiatives, Ali, um, but it was definitely a deliberate focus to, um, to connect, right? To connect on a personal level, because it really, it, it is a team sport. And, and to be an effective team player, like you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of your teams and you need to know what they're going through and you need to be part of it. And they need to know what you're going through too. So it also means like being vulnerable about yourself. So, um, I hope I answered your question. And if there's any follow-up, I'm happy, happy to share other, other thoughts or examples. No, totally. Thank you so much, Steve. I truly value you need to make a conscious effort for human interaction in, in times like this. It's, it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of leverage off of that, um, what new ways do you think um, will remain after COVID in terms of new business models and, and human interaction and what old ways will be abandoned? Yeah, some new, some new ways that are already starting to evolve now is uh, the way that we communicate. The, the way that we, we don't all actually need to be in the room at the same time. So we did a presentation to win a school in uh, Cranston, Rhode Island. And um, half of the team members actually did it in person and, and half of the team members actually called in and were on Zoom while we were doing our presentation. And it was the best presentation that I've been to in many years. And it, it, at first we're like, how are we gonna do this? This is hybrid. We couldn't all be together because of the density of the room. We had to be split up, but it was so engaging um, and so well, well done. I see it moving, moving forward. Another example is, um, is uh, technology has come a long way also through collaboration. So the technology I share with everyone on this call is called Mural. If you haven't heard of Mural, uh, you need to get it. It's super cheap. It is like a virtual whiteboard. It's an interactive whiteboard that you can uh, download pictures or graphs or your presentation and people can zoom in and out of it and we can work on it at the same time. And you can call people to look at the same thing that you're looking at. So Allison, like that is a tool that's in our toolbox now that wasn't before. And no matter if we go back to normalcy, you know, this program mural is going to be, you know, moving forward It's part of our tools now that we didn't have. So it forces to adapt and discover new things to help us collaborate. Totally. Aaron, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, um, I would say I, I'm going to agree with Steve. Um, that 
I think the the technology stuff that we've picked up over the course of this COVID is gonna is something that's gonna remain. Like these, unfortunately, as much as we all hate like Zoom meetings, I think they're here to stay. To be honest with you, you know, when we had in the in the old ways when there was a project meeting and say I was working on a project out in Amherst and I'm in Boston, it was sort of expected that you were gonna make the trip out to Amherst for that meeting. I just don't see that happening anymore. Right when I'm able to join in a meeting like this. Um, I don't have to make the time and spend two and a half hours driving out to Amherst if, and from Boston and then two and a half hours back if I can just jump on a call and then I just gained four and a half hours of my day back. Um, I can't see virtual meetings going away. Um, I think people have become comfortable with Zoom as much as you, know, you don't really love to stay on them for too long. I think that uh, in general, virtual meetings are probably here to stay. Um, even after we all go back into an office of some sort, whatever that means. And speaking of that, I think office space in general is going to change as we move forward because working from home, I think people for, I mean, I've almost been home for a year now and I've, I have not literally been in the office since March 6th of last year and was able to do our job from home. Um, so for me, it's, you know, I live, I live about, you know, an hour and 15 minute commute from Boston. I, I don't know why I would want to do that every day again. Um, <laughs> once we all get back to normal. So I think, um, you know, office space is probably gonna change too. We have some um, stuff that we're talking about. We have a, our lease in Boston is coming up in 2023. Like we're already talking about like, are we gonna need the same kind of space anymore? Do we have, do we, do we pull people out of Boston and put some satellite offices somewhere else? So there's a huge discussion about office space and how that's gonna look and whether or not I actually need an office anymore. Do I even need to go to an office? Like that's, I think, you know, a lot of companies are talking like that. So, you know, office space, virtual meetings are here to stay. Working from home is here to stay. You know, even when we go back to normal, I can tell you right now that I probably will work from home at least three days a week um, instead of going back to the office for five. Um, it's just nice to gain all that time back in your day. I've been able to spend more time with my family, which is nice. So I think a lot of people are going to take advantage of that moving forward. It's not a bad thing. Um, I think some of the other stuff that we have that's changed a little bit too is um, in recruiting. Uh, the, our recruiting has changed a little bit. You know, we're not limited anymore to geographic areas. I think we have people that are working for us now who are in Chicago. Um, we don't have a Chicago office, but they work from Chicago. We have people in Florida who are working from Florida right now. We don't have a Florida office. So we're not now, I think we can expand our reach for, for uh, geographic hiring, um, which is helpful because the, you know, the war for talent is something that's kind of a limiting factor to growth for a lot of companies. So if you can expand your area of geographic reach um, and not have to have people go into a physical office, but you can do all your work and, and um, it's worked out well for us. So I think that uh, is also something that's going to change in the future. Yeah, I, I would imagine it just adds total flexibility in terms of geographic location. Um, but on other and another side of it is uh, company culture and sure. like how has that been redefined in a remote world? People are not yeah. going into the office every day. You don't have that interaction. Yeah, so it's really gonna... difficult. Yeah, we definitely talk about that a lot too because the culture is a huge part of our company um, and having that daily interaction and, and Steve mentioned sort of the water cooler discussions. Those are you know running into somebody in the kitchen because you're both going to get coffee at the same time. Like that doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, we've been pretty deliberate in setting up um, times that people can get together and, you know, virtual coffee hours and, um, you know, happy hours. We've been doing those too, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, we've done some, some intentional bonding time. Uh, it's certainly not the same. And in, it's a balance, I think. Um, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to work five days from home just from my from you know, my position in the company, I mean, I need to be touching a whole lot of people. So um, I'm not gonna be able to work five days from home, but I think it will change a little bit in the fact that you know, people will be able to pop in and out of offices when they need to. Uh, but I don't, I don't see offices going away completely, really, just for that reason, for the culture piece and, and being able to hang out with your coworkers in person is, there's something to be said about that. I think we all took it for granted before the pandemic. And now I think we all understand how important it is. So that, you know, culture is definitely something that we're going to have to think about and, and when we're having these discussions about office space and working from home and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, totally. Joanna, do you have anything to add to that? So I was going to echo what both Steve and Aaron noted about comfortability with technology 
prior to the COVID pandemic, I would say that most of the employees were not comfortable using Teams, using Zoom. It was a relatively new technology and everyone has certainly become comfortable using those technologies over the last year or so. And another thing I would say in regards to corporate culture, and I can speak specifically for Weston and Samson is, I feel like our company has made a conscious effort to, to embrace the, the social challenges and the um, just the social challenges that are happening right now in the country. It's, you know, it can be difficult times for people since the pandemic has started. So we've created some new committees and initiatives to help support employees and incorporate collaboration as we work. Um, this also includes introducing a importance of the understanding of diversity into our workplace. So since the pandemic has started, um, we've created a caretaker support group that meets weekly for people to be able to discuss issues that are happening in their lives and, and mostly not even related to work, just a support group for each other. You know, as you're working from home, if you have kids at home, it can be very challenging. And, you know, the company recognizes it's, a, it's important to support employees with issues that are occurring both in work and out of work, you know, and that, and that makes you a better worker if you're, if you're supported in that way. Um, we also have a culture club at Weston and Samson that's a group that discusses the where our corporate culture stands, where we want it to go, how it's perceived by employees, how it's perceived by others. And we actively work to improve our culture, both to keep existing employees happy and to attract great new candidates. Um, so I think these efforts have really, have really intensified over the COVID pandemic. You know, before they were maybe in the background a bit, but now it's come to the, the forefront and, you know, it's really recognized that you have to maintain a, a good culture to retain employees and to attract new employees as well. Yeah, and to just add on that, um, you know, employees are dealing per with personal and professional life at home now. So there's just an added pressure for employees to do their job effectively, do it productively. Um, so just to recognize and come up with solutions to make sure that these things are addressed is an important thing. Um, so in terms of the products or services, um, do you think that the quality of your products have been affected um, during this pandemic? Um, have you made any adjustments to maintain the quality of your standards during this time? Allison, you want me to take a swing at it? Yeah, we can get the construction side and then maybe Aaron can fill in on the design side. Sure. So uh, I, was, I can say with confidence that the quality of, of our construction has not been affected uh, whatsoever, but there's been some really interesting uh, side benefits that have come out. So this year at Kilbane, uh, we noticed that our safety performance um, was, is the best it's ever been. And in fact, from, compared from 2019 to 2020, you know, our recordable incident rate uh, improved by 24% and our lost time incident rate improved by 48%. And we didn't do anything drastic, right? We made some small changes, but to have that such a significant impact, I think has to do uh, d because of uh, all of us um, are more caring, right? We won't, we're actually thinking about our health as individuals, right? And, uh, you know, every day in the paper, there's something about, you know, about your personal, me you know, personal health, your, your well-being, um, your mental health, and your physical health. And I think that that translated directly to the job sites. And I think that, um, you know, to come to a, a Gilbane job site now, we have, you know, you, you're checking in, you're asking yourself, do I feel sick? You know, do I have a temperature? You're actually doing a self check before you enter a site. And I think that the industry as a whole has made a movement towards a, towards that, that's translated to safer job site activities. So um, a byproduct of this, uh, terrible pandemic is actually safer job sites. I, I feel pretty confident um, about that. The other thing that's been interesting is uh, with that caring is our clients also are very curious. You know, how many people are working today? How many people are, are, are out sick? 
and our clients are also feeling that connection with the workers on site, which sometimes I hate to say it, they not always were. Right? They didn't really care what was happening as long as it was happening, but now there's a sense of caring um, culture that, that's translating through. And the other element uh, that has also greatly improved is our communication between our project teams and our clients and our design teams. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, these, these uh, Zoom calls are also, they're an hour long, they start on time, they finish on time. Um, beforehand, you may have noticed, ah, I'll, I'll come in after I get this cup of coffee and you show up seven minutes late. And then you have to restart the introduction, right? I'm noticing a very disciplined approach to like getting things done and communicating things and communicating delays and, or communicating impacts to the jobs. There's been an enhanced level of communication. Um, the root cause of it, I'm not, I'm still exploring, but I have to say like, you know, everybody showed up on time on this call, in fact, early, you know, like I, we're seeing a very disciplined approach to like getting stuff done and, and increased communication. And I know it sounds different because I started saying, hey, don't forget to include the soft side, the personal side of our communication, right? Because, you know, you know, while, uh, while I was going to get a coffee, there's, you know, people were talking about, what are you doing this weekend? You know, so we're missing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but getting work done is definitely, definitely happening and has been an improvement. So I know it sounds weird, but through the pandemic, you know, we have executed our projects really well and better than we had uh, before. So that's, that's, that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I would um, echo Steve there that, uh, you know, this 2020 was actually our most profitable year as a company that we've ever had, which is really strange to say. Um, if you had asked me when we first had this pandemic starting, it would be, I would tell you you're crazy if you were thinking that, but everybody sort of, um, you know, made that switch to working from home and the technology that we had. Luckily, our IT group at our company was, you know, ahead of it on this, which was great. It was kind of a smooth transition, but you know, in terms of quality, we, we have a really big focus on quality assurance, quality control at our company and always have. I think what made it a little bit difficult in the move to working from home um, full time was we have a lot of, you know, long time employees, a lot of old school engineers who like to use paper. And when you're doing reviews of plans, they would have the person who they were working with print them out. They'd go sit in a room and mark them up with red pen and then give them back. And that wasn't possible anymore. So there was, a there was a learning curve where those type of engineers, and we have you know, a fair amount of them, um, had to make the switch to reviewing plans on Bluebeam and reviewing plans in PDF form and marking those up and then having those sent by email back to the engineer to, to make the changes on the plans. That was a bit of a learning curve for certain people. I mean, it took a good couple of months for that to, to flush itself out um, there, luckily, I think everybody kind of embraced it once they knew it was going to be a long time before we got back in an office. Um, so we've gotten to a point where I think it's in a good place. Uh, the other thing that I think is a little bit more difficult is the onboarding process. So I would say the quality control of like new employees, say new grads and new employees coming in, you know, you used to be able to sit with them at their desk and go through something on their computer with them. You can still do that, um, you know, share screens with, with teams and zoom and everything. Um, it's just a little bit more difficult. So, uh, you know, finding, getting new hires up to speed is a little bit more difficult um, and getting them, they eventually get there. It just takes a little bit longer in the virtual world than it did at, at, um, at home. But the quality of the work that we put out this year is, is actually, it's surprising to me that we were able to roll right into it and, and still have the quality of work that we did when we put it out, so. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Um, and I do want to segue a little bit in terms of what you we were saying about training. Um, Joanna, do you think that the quality and quantity of training sessions has been affected during this time? So the quantity of training sessions has absolutely increased for us during the pandemic. And that's mostly due to the need for significant training on use of PPE and COVID protocols and field site visit rules associated with that. Um, we had weekly safety um, training meetings anyway, and now there's been an added COVID feature that we're all mandated to take COVID safety training. So the quantity has increased, um, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, the most important 
thing is to keep everybody safe, both in the office, at home, on the job site. So quantity has increased. Um, the quality, I think, if anything, ha has improved. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and as others have mentioned, we really embrace the use of teams and other meeting and collaboration technologies. And there are features mm -hmm. within the software that allow for increased engagement during training sessions, you know, polling and live feedback, enhanced visuals, the use of breakout rooms, et cetera. Um, I believe that enhances the training, whereas before we were just sitting in a room listening to somebody speak and everyone's just sitting there, not really giving any feedback, not really engaged. So, so the use of these tools has definitely increased the quality of training. Um, and it's, you know, a step up from your standard PowerPoint presentation, you know, all in a conference room, just, just watching that. So, um, so those are my thoughts on, on quantity and quality of training. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, the, having the uh, improvements to technology is a, is a huge thing. Um, and it allows for direct feedback from all, various employees, which is a very important thing. Um, I want to switch gears here a little bit um, and kind of talk on marketing. So um, do you think that there are challenges of marketing your company to prospective candidates in this time? Um, Aaron, do you want to take the wheel on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say that there are definitely some challenges. Um, you know, the most glaring one is the fact that we can't be out and about, um, say at, you know, job fairs, uh, you know, virtual job fairs. I've actually done a couple of them. They're just not as effective as being there in person in a booth at some place where you can talk to people. Um, so that's been tough. I think also just traditional conferences where you're out and about and people see you're doing stuff. Those aren't a thing right now. Um, you know, they've, again, we've done like virtual conferences, but it's just not the same. And I think there's going to be a consistent theme here that I'm talking about is just that you're not able to be in front of people the way that you were before. Um, lack of traditional BD opportunity. So we used to get together with industry groups, um, you know, after work at night, you know, and wherever it was, whether it was NAOP or BSA or all of these other um, industry groups that we used to be a part of and where you do a lot of your business development, you know, that was getting in front of people um, and that was helping you in your recruitment of people at that time. So in marketing your company, um, you know, and in general, I think marketing to new people and, and recruiting has been affected too, where uh, in this kind of economy where it's a little, it, you know, the economy has been holding strong, but I think people are, you know, optimistic, but I think that also people are less willing to make a move during kind of one of the, it's just so unknown right now what's happening. People are, if you have a job and it's a solid job, you're less likely to make a jump right now, even if it might be a better position that you might be jumping to. It's just, people are comfortable where they're at right now. And it's hard, it's been hard recruiting, I think for that. And it, I mean, before the pandemic, it was hard to recruit anyway. There were just not a whole lot of people to recruit. Um, and I think the pandemic made it a little bit worse, but I think just in general, my theme moving on this topic is really just not being able to be in front of people in, in person, physical in front of people has been um, difficult in the marketing. Um, do you think that like there's been adjustments, adjustments made for reading body language when you're interviewing um, virtually potential candidates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been harder for sure. I mean, I do a lot of interviews uh, and you know, you have to make some changes to the questions that you're asking to try to get a, a better feel for the people that you're, you're interviewing. You used to be able to ask, you know, pretty basic questions and you can tell whether a person is, a person is nervous or, or how their body language does, but now we only see each other from here up. So uh, it's definitely a different, different, um, I've been interviewing people is definitely different now than it was before. Um, but I think, again, for the most part, people have kind of adjusted to this virtual, uh, we see each other in a box mode. Um, so it, I feel like the interviews I've done over the past couple of months are way better than the ones that I was doing back in April and May. I've gotten used to it. Yeah, I think a little bit. <laughs> uh, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? No, oh, I think uh, it's um, the the body language question is a really good question. And uh, when looking for new candidates, uh, would you rather you know sit with them, you know, ten feet apart with you know with with only looking at you know you can look in their eyes, but that's it, right? You can't see the rest. You can't tell they're smiling or or, or grimacing. 
Um, or then you've got this interaction where it's, uh, it's tough to see, like, are they shaking their legs? Are they nervous? Are they sweating? You know, you can't really see that. Um, I'll turn the question around just a little bit, Allison, um, and think about like our own, our, you know, how people perceive uh, you, right, as a leader, so every, everyone on this call, right? So like, I have a client um, who now who works from home, um, who wears a sweatshirt now. He doesn't know, no, 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 no need for a collar or a jacket. Um, and, and he looks at his camera like this, right? So we're having a conversation. He's not looking me in the eye and he's wearing a sweatshirt and, you know, I'm in his kitchen and um, it's, it's distracting to me, right? Like it's like, it's distracting to me. So I think maybe, you know, for um, the folks that are on this call, think about your perception and your image. Like we still need to be effective. Like I get it working from home is easier, right? Cause you don't have to deal with all the things that Aaron was talking about, but we still have our own personal image to, to uphold, right? We still have, we are still professionals. And depending upon your background, it can be distracting. Like this background of red is really distracting to me, <laughs> but, but, um, but, uh, but think about that in our presentation, you know, even this morning, I was like, honey, where's my jacket? I've got that thing. Um, but, but we still need to be conscientious of our own image and how we effectively communicate with people. The key word is, is effective communication, right? And, and also to Aaron's point, um, asking the right questions and going a little bit deeper, right? Like I, I heard what you said, you know, and I kind of noticed a hesitation, like yeah, I almost have to call it out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind explaining a little bit more what you meant by that? So that, 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 uh, that those secondary questions become even more crucial um, in the interview process and in, in an infect, effective communication process too. So uh, I, I hope that answers your question, Allison. Totally does. Thank you. Um, so Joanna, um, during the interview or hiring process, how are you actively trying to stay engaged with other candidates? So COVID hasn't really affected the recruiting process that much. I solicited some feedback from our HR and our recruiting department on this question as well. And they said that the process is pretty much the same with one change of definitely um, substituting in-person interviews with, with video interviews as we've been discussing. Um, I'd say that LinkedIn is widely used both in recruiting and following up with candidates. So, you know, a little plug in to keep your LinkedIn profile up to date and um, add any achievements you have, any volunteer um, opportunities that you've participated in, that, that's an important tool that recruiters certainly use. Um, I know I could use a spruce up on my own LinkedIn profile, so, you know, just to, to throw it out there. Um, but the, the whole process hasn't changed much. I mean, we have some regional offices. We have offices all along the East Coast from um, New Hampshire down to Florida, so video interviews were used in the past if you're interviewing a candidate in a remote location that you wouldn't be able to see them in person anyway. It's just more, more widely used now. And I would echo what Steve said about presenting yourself well on video, being aware of your background, being aware of how you're perceived, where are you looking, where is your camera located? Because I speak to people as well whose camera is off to the side and they're, they're absolutely not looking at you when you're, when you're talking to them and that is distracting. So if you're in an interview type situation, you want to be aware of that so that you're actively looking your interviewer in the eye and engaging with them. Thank you. And this is going to be the final question from us, but I see that you guys have been um, participating in the chat. So we'll get to that Q&A session shortly. Um, and the last question is for Aaron. Um, are the young or new staff retaining information provided during trainings? And do you think there are any positives from training remotely? I think we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but if you want to elaborate. Yeah, I mean, I would say, are the young and new staff retaining information provided during training? I would say it's, that, that's a challenge actually. I mean, and that's just a learning style thing really. I mean, I am a terrible learner when uh, somebody's talking at me. Um, so I don't like lectures. The lecture kind of, um, you know, it was a struggle for me when I was in school because a lot of, obviously all, with all the students we have on the, 
the call today, you understand you're sitting in a lecture room and they're just talking at you and writing some stuff on the board. And, um, you know, I do my best learning when I'm, when I'm hands-on kind of understanding and getting, you know, lab work was great for me. I mean, I learned a lot in my, my labs and everything. So the trainings, I would say, I would say this new staff retains stuff less now than they did before being in-person training. Uh, it's just my, my personal thought on it, but the positive from it is that the technology allows us to record all of our trainings now. So they're on demand basically as needed. So you almost don't need to retain all the information that we're giving you because you can just go back and look at it anytime you want at this point. So I would say in general, people are retaining less, but they have access to it more. So it's almost kind of a wash. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that, but. I, I did want to share a concept that about training. It's an interesting question. What I, what's concerned me the most about not being in person is, uh, you know, when you're working at your workstation and you hear another conversation that's happening, right? Um, and uh, most of the time you just ignore it, but you're like, wait a minute, like, that's interesting to me. I have that same problem. I'm going to steal that idea. Or mm -hmm. like, that's interesting to me. I don't know how to fix this problem. And then you, you know, confront the person say, you know, can you help me? Like, I'm going through this right now. What I think, Allison, is um, there's definitely a loss in collaboration, passive collaboration. And, you know, uh, the, the major design trends prior to COVID were to increase collaboration, right? No more offices. It's 100% open workspace. No more, you know, all of our intermediate partitions are going to be low, low, low. So you can actually look at your coworkers in the eye, right? And that we're gaining, there was a, a value in passive collaboration that could turn into active collaboration. And that is gone. That, that is absolutely gone uh, in, in this world of COVID. So it forces us as individuals to um, actually share information, overshare, and it forces us as individuals um, to look for those nuggets of gold that may be uh, interest of us. So if you, you know, it means that people who are going through experiences, you want to have uh, deliberate uh, interactions and sharing of information so that if you accidentally have that, like, oh my gosh, that's super interesting. I'm having the same problem. How do I learn from this? Um, how that how, how you can have that transaction because the passive collaboration is lost and it really actually scares me, uh, especially for the for the new hires right because I remember um, when I started on construction site in a trailer I knew nothing, and the only thing that I learned was when I was listening to the you know to the old dude in the corner of the trailer yelling at someone else I'm like oh that guy messed up like that's not good I, you know and I would pay attention because I'd be like I don't want to make that mistake right. And uh, so I can't learn from other people's mistakes when I'm, when I'm all by myself. Um, so opening that up, recognizing that, and then sharing like, hey, this is, those lessons learned meetings now are super, so that'd be a tactic to recover from that. Like, let's have a lessons learned meeting from this experience. Let's have a lessons learned on our meeting. Let's have a lessons learned on how this week went. Like we need to openly share to replace that passive collaboration that we're missing. Totally, that's a great point. Thank you for that. So I think that um, that wraps up our questions, but I see that you guys have put some in the chat. Um, so I think Diana is going to take the lead on asking the questions. Yes, thank you, Allison. So we have a great post in the chat right now. I find that many engineers and some clients can be introverts. What methods have you used to get them to open up since we cannot do it in person right now? Hmm. Well, Steve's not an introvert, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I am an introvert though. I am naturally an introvert and it's been difficult. Uh, you know, I, I, like, I always like to say I'm a, I'm a friendly guy, but I'm also an, naturally an introvert. So it's been something that I focus on all the time and when I was coming up through. So I'm in tune with the fact that most engineers are uh, introverts. I think in general, we have a bunch of really good people at our company, um, really friendly people, really open people. And I think that culture plays a big part in allowing people to open up and being in an inclusive place where people feel like they can be their, their honest self um, helps a lot. So we focus a lot on that. 
And I think by just having a place where people feel like they can come and be honest with and be themselves um, allows people to become less introverted. You're not ever going to not be an introvert, but um, feel comfortable opening up when you get there. So I think culture plays a big part in that. And I would add something to that, that with, with meetings being held through the use of this technology, it actually allows flexibility for people who may feel more introverted to communicate. For example, this chat on the side, people are free to type their questions into the chat. They don't mm -hmm. have to speak up during the meeting or you know, interject if they're not comfortable doing so. They can do it in a more passive way by typing it into the chat. There are even functions where you can type in an anonymous question into the chat on the side if you don't even want to put your name out there. So introverts may feel more comfortable communicating that way. Um, some people are a little uncomfortable turning their camera on. I know at my company, we don't force people to do that. They're encouraged to turn their camera on, but they're not forced to do it. So um, it allows for a little bit of flexibility. If you are an introvert, you don't, you're not standing up in front of a group of people live. You're able to communicate in, in other ways that may be more comfortable to you. All right, thank you. How much is automization process replacing labor from the workplace? Do you think this problem is becoming worse due to technical advancement during the pandemic? I'll, I'll take a crack. I think that um, I know at Gilbane we have uh, so robots don't get COVID, right? <laughs> robots robots actually don't need heat. Robots don't need light. Um, robots can work in any any sort of conditions, and so I can tell you, you know that realization has um, forced us to make investments in that type of technology. And I think that you're gonna see uh, advancements in um, executing and building work that is gonna be less, less and less uh, dependent upon humans. Now, there are crafts and trades that will never be replaced by robots, right? Because some of the crafts are, are so, it's almost an art and the, you know, the skill is so, is so it requires human feel and touch and heat and sight, um, but there are there are rote uh, mechanical tasks um, that are dangerous that could easily be re replaced by by robotics. So that's kind of the robotic side. But probably um, uh, someone else would want to answer from a technology side how that how that has come. But I can tell you that this has forced us like um, there are conditions you know humans and, and also the the value of life. And the value of the safety of humans is also important. Like that, that is that's very sensitive to everyone right now. And um, if we could replace that with a non-human, uh, that would be great for our industry. Yeah, I don't. Um, from the technology side, we're getting more efficient with what we do on the design side of the things because of the technology that we have, the computer programs, uh, you know, AutoCAD has gotten so much better at doing certain things that we used to do by hand. Um, but in general, we still need people to run those programs. So, you know, I don't see on the design side automation becoming an issue. Um, where I would see it and where we do see it in our company is on the survey side of the, of the house. I mean, we do surveys using drones now. We, use, we do bridge inspections using drones. We have um, one man survey crews who can, can go out and survey 20 acres in a day where it used to take them a week with three guys before. So, I mean, that is the part of our business that I see the most automation and you know the robotics part of it and uh, making the most impact. But on the design side, the civil engineering side, you know, we're, like I said, the technology makes us more efficient and uh, able to do better designs now, um, but we definitely still need people to run those programs. And it's not gonna, it's not like we are eventually gonna get to a point where a monkey could do our jobs, I don't think. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but yeah, it's, that's kind of the technology side of it. At least that's what I see. I don't know if Joanna has anything to add to that. No, I'm all set. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. This question came from the registrations. Are there any CDC COVID protocols that prevent you from interfacing with the customer? I can, um, I can speak to that. So 
We have had significant restrictions on customer interaction over the pandemic, and um, it it hasn't always been from CDC protocols, but rather um, our own internal company protocols or client protocols. For example, um, I do a lot of work with National Grid, and they had they themselves required all of their vendors to go through extensive training on um, requirements to visit project sites and it was it's extremely prohibitive and um, we we limited our project site visits be because of those prohibitive protocols and with the understanding that number one is it's important to keep everyone safe but um, but it certainly limited our ability to do the number of site visits or client um, visits that we had done in the past Yeah, I would say it stinks not touching people from a client like a you know a, a handshake. So that that definitely there is there is a bond that is formed just by shaking someone's hand. We've we've had less clients like we don't like yeah come on over to our office you know we don't really do that. The only clients that we've had in our office are clients that have said can we come to your office. Um, so that that kind of stinks. Um, and then when, uh, when they do come to, you know, clients do come to the office, um, you know, we're so spaced out that you kind of miss that, um, that human aspect. And as I said before, you know, you, you look at, you look at them in the eye, but that's, that's about it. So those guidelines have really, you know, interfered, um, human relationships and human connections, um, which is integral in, in the, in the engineering world, you know, we're building with purpose, you know, we're not just, we're not just writing lines, um, on paper or, or on our computers, you know, we're building something that's going to help somebody improve somebody's lives, right? We're, we're building bridges so that we have access to cities, you know, we're building buildings so that we can heal the sick in hospitals um, and not be having that intimate connection with our clients. It is an interference, it definitely is. All right, thank you. So we have a number of students also joining us today. And one has asked, are there any essential skills that we should also be learning outside of class to become a civil engineer, especially during this time in the pandemic, taking any opportunity to really enhance further? I can go first if, if you want. Um, so what I see engineering and consulting engineering in particular is all about relationships and developing relationships. So being able to speak to people, being able to present yourself well, your project well, your ideas well, um, in both person, in person and um, in written form is very important. You want to be able to develop relationships with people. So um, going back to that introvert question, you know, to, to push yourself and get yourself to be comfortable speaking to people and communicating with people is a very important life skill that's not necessarily taught in engineering school. Joanna just hit it on the head, hit the nail on the head there. I was going to say the same thing. It's about, you know, public speaking and um, you know, just generally the soft skills involved with being a human and dealing with other human beings is really important. You guys learn at Northeastern, everything's technical that you need to know when you get out of school. Um, and other students at other schools learn that basically the same thing, you know, water flows downhill everywhere. <laughs> I mean, we can teach you the other stuff that you need to know in, in terms of technical stuff, we don't have an issue with that. I mean, if you're looking for something technical, I would say, you know, early on in your career, at least at Niche, um, you know, the, the better you are at AutoCAD and Civil 3D, the better off you're going to be. So that's something that, you know, technical, I could tell you um, to focus on. So the better off you are, you know, coming in with that. So hone your skills in that. But otherwise, it's really about the soft skills. I mean, we can teach you everything you need to know about it, being an engineer technically, but we can't you know, we can help you with the soft skills, but you've got to be able to really kind of embrace that and, and know that that's part of the bit, that's part of being a professional, like as Joanna said. I, I'd love to offer a tactic. So like, I love, I love civil engineers. I'm a civil engineer because mm -hmm. uh, they are the, the master problem solvers of anything, right? If you're a civil engineer, I promise you that you can solve any problem uh, put, put in front of you. Um, 
a tactic to enhance your communication skills, um, and I'm actually starting to see it on resumes of new hires, is um, is phone conversations, right? Like using using a phone to communicate. So if you're wondering, you know, taking Joanna and Aaron's feedback, like how do I how do I do this? How do I how do I communicate better? I would say practice just by using the phone instead of using an email. Pick up and use a phone. Or if you're on an internship, and sometimes on internships you have to call many people to set up many meetings. Instead of sending an email out, practice by using a phone. That would be a great way to get used to um, presenting yourself. Um, and I, you know, I, I actually still, you know, my children are, are teenagers now. Uh, they're complete idiots. But we actually like practice phone conversations. Like when you call somebody, you don't start a conversation as "Hey." Well, you'd actually need to introduce yourself so they know who you are, right? And that people don't think about that because we start texts with "Hey." Right, and and they already know who who the other who the other person is. So, but practicing phone conversations, I know it sounds so corny and it's an old technology, but it's perfect example. A phone conversation sets up anything, sets up how you'd start a meeting by an introduction, the purpose of my call, that's a purpose of a meeting, and then a closing and, and, a, and, a, and a farewell salutation is a great way to establish a flow of open and easy conversation. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really great point, Steve, because I tell this to all of our younger engineers too, is like, pick up the phone and call them instead of sending an email, you, you know, you're going to, number one, it gets you that relationship that Joanna was talking about. It gets you um, more involved with that person as a, you're not just a screen, you know, some words on a screen, you're a person they're talking to and they can understand, they hear your voice, they hear your tone. Um, and again, when you send an email, tone is a huge thing. So you can send an email and think you wrote something innocuous and it comes across to that other person as not innocuous and you didn't mean it that way. But when you're talking to somebody, it's really much more easy to figure out what something somebody's saying means. So I, I love that idea, Steve. Just pick up the phone instead of sending an email and have a conversation with somebody, especially when there's an issue you're trying to work out with somebody. Trying to work out an issue over email is ridiculous. Like just pick up the phone talk to them on the phone. You're going to get to an answer much quicker. And it's just a more personal way to, to have a conversation with somebody as opposed to an email. Definitely. And you can also expand your network by joining NUCIO. I just <laughs> shared all of the social information in the chat with you all too. While discussing students with people working remotely, do you see that there's going to be a long-term impact with co-op and internships? Um, we haven't stopped. We haven't stopped our co-op or, or, or internship programs at this point. So um, we don't plan to. Um, I think it's it's something that we have committed to, and I think it's important, just as important as it was before. So we we have a commitment to continue doing that, and and we'll do so until it doesn't make sense anymore. I guess. Yeah, their internships are a vital part of our of our of their growth in our organization. So. Um, Super critical, need internships, uh, love Northeastern interns. So, uh, you know, you've got, you know, we have many folks that work at Kilbane that are on, on, on this board. So please reach out to them if you're interested. Send me a note if you're interested. Um, it's critical to our industry that um, folks that join Gilbane have had professional internships, right? And it's important for your growth as students to, to also validate, like, is this a field I actually want to do? Right, like, and do I want to go into an engineering side of things? Do I want to go into a construction side of things? Internships are vital to figuring all of that stuff out. Like, what does my future career look like, and uh, and is this a company that I want to work for? So, yeah, similar to Aaron, like, we're all in. Uh, vital to not just uh, your individual careers as students, but vital to the industry as a whole to make sure that you know you're you're going to be happy, you know, when when you grow up. And same with us, Weston Sampson continues to hire co-ops and interns um, throughout the pandemic. Um, we have a lot of Northeastern grads working at Weston and Sampson. We always hire co-ops during all rounds and that hasn't stopped or slowed down at all. Um, there may be a little bit of challenges only working remotely. And you know, like um, Allie said, her first day was remote. So a co-op's first day may be remote, but we, we work through those challenges, but we're still committed to hiring co-ops and interns as, as always, and that hasn't stopped. All right, well, 
I guess ending it on another hiring question, Aaron had brought up that he was asking new questions during virtual hiring. Mm -hmm. What new hiring questions are being asked during hiring? And can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I can't tell you my secrets or if you become an interview with me, you're going to know what I'm going to ask you. But um, I would say like, as Steve said, um, you know, you have to, sometimes it's more, it's not less about the questions and more about how, you know, the follow-up questions. So it's, because I can't read people as well on the screen, um, you know, it's a, you don't, I don't let people off with easy answers anymore. It's more digging behind those answers that I, that I guess what I was kind of getting at. And Steve mentioned that too, when he was talking, I think it's more about that as opposed to I've invented all this, all these new crazy questions that are, uh, um, you know, get to the heart of people's, you know, mental states a lot quicker. But um, I think it's more about, uh, the follow-up questions and, and not allowing like a simple answer to, to pass because I saw how you answered it. It's just more about the digging behind uh, the answers and the questions that I've been, been asking. So, If I was a student and I was applying uh, for a job um, at, at Niche um, and, and listening to this discussion today, I would make sure that my answers uh, articulated uh, the question very well. Like I would come to an interview very prepared. Um, I would come with examples that would exemplify uh, my work ethic or my experience or my interest in the field. So uh, to the students um, that are listening to this panel, think about uh, the feedback that you learned today. Like it's harder for, the, for an interviewer to get, to get you know, to know you. So make it easier for them. Right, make it easier for them by coming prepared, and make it easier for an interviewer to to get to know you. And maybe you maybe you overshare a little bit about yourself. It's not an interview is not a time to put your guard up. It's actually a time to put your guard down, so that mm -hmm. so that like Joanna said, um, it's important that you come to work and you're your, your authentic self, and you want people to know and appreciate you for who you are, not for a dressed up person that you're not. Right, like be be your true self. So. Um, that's some advice that I would give folks who are looking for a job, not just students, but, but anyone who's looking for a job. And I'll share that something that I always look for during an interview is the, the why. Why do you want this job? Why did you choose this career path? Why are you interested in engineering? And the more passionate and descriptive you are about the why, and shows your excitement, it also gets the interviewer excited to want to hire you. Because we all want to hire people who, who, who really are excited to, to work here, to work for us, to do this job, to work on these projects with these clients. And the more sure you are about your why, and the more you can articulate that to your interviewer, the more excited they will be to hire you as well, because they want someone that wants it. I think um, all it's one o'clock right now. Um, so, uh, Diana, do we have any more outstanding questions that need to get answered? We do have one, and it's for any and all speakers. Have you seen any new design trends in your field as a result of COVID? Reduce building density, enhance water main disinfection, et cetera. I can speak to that one um, because in in our line of business, this is definitely true. For example, we do a lot of um, MEP building design where um, we're designing ventilation systems and due to COVID, the demand for increased ventilation has been a, a huge topic. So that has affected some of our designs where the need for you know, increased air exchanges, bringing in more fresh air to buildings is, is of great concern. Um, similarly, we do a lot of work in the water and wastewater industry. So as you can imagine, um, if someone has COVID, then it, it's passed along to the wastewater stream. And for workers in wastewater plants, you know, being concerned about droplets in the, in the air, um, COVID droplets in the air and protection for the workers. So that's been a huge topic of discussion as well, how to design for safety of workers in wastewater plants where COVID might be um, introduced into the air or, you know, droplets or, or, or splashed up. So um,
All right, well, I think um, that concludes the question and answer session. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we truly appreciate your participation. And a big, big thank you goes out to our panelists who have generously volunteered their time and were willing to share their experiences with all of us. 